So I am joined by Dr. Derek E. White, full professor at the University of Kentucky and author of what is becoming one of my favorite books, uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Dr. White, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. Good, so, man. Glad to be here. Thanks yeah, man. Me. No, like we were we were talking before taping and I'm I'm a, it's so nice to talk to another college football fan, especially <laughs> one who's seeped in history because I feel like all I've been doing is talking about history here lately. That's all we got, man. It's history because uh, the you know we just the 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 game is just opening back up and it might close before it even starts. Oh man, and I'm having to cover it every single day. So there were things in your book that focuses on Jake Gaither uh, and fam you Rattlers that hit so close to home for me. One, but also allowed me to fill in gaps in what I already thought that I knew and things that I don't. So for one. The number of teachers in black community, particularly in my house and in the friends and houses of my friends, my middle school teacher in Panama City, Florida, is a FAMU grad. My principal at that same middle school was a FAMU grad. He played offensive line at FAMU. And I would look around and say, yo, man, can can we do something other than be teachers? And they and that was that was a rub, right? That was a rub. It's like, hey, first of all, we needed teachers. Second of all, there, that gets complicated. And you, in this book, have really laid out and done a great way of uncomplicating so many questions that I know many have, myself included. But I want to start with some positive here, which is that heyday of like 1967, right in there at the end of segregation, when Grambling, FAMU, Tennessee State, Prairie View A&M are all really just churning on all cylinders. What do you think it would look like today if we still had the level of success that we saw at Grambling, at Prairie View A&M, at Tennessee State, at FAMU? Um, I think you would see, one, uh, black colleges would be um, – they would be comparable to what we think of as – you know, many of the state universities, right? Like, what? you know, I think they wouldn't be flagships, I think, you know, because I'm in higher, ed uh, higher education, I understand how flagships work, right? Mm -hmm. The University of Florida, University of Kentucky, University of Oklahoma Texas, has more recent, yeah. right? Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma has more resources than Oklahoma State, right? That's right. just the way flagships work. But if you think of the way that the second team operates in many states, so like a Florida State or uh, Oklahoma State, right? Grambling and Tennessee State, um, you know, Florida A&M, if they had given equal resources and been able to grow at the rate, you know, building on the talent level that they had in the mid 1960s, they could there's a there's an argument to be made that they would at least athletically and I think also academically could really compete uh, in in this kind of marketplace of, of college athletics. You write as this is coming apart with integration and with the infuse of money from television about the 1978 FAMU squad that, well, is really great. And then I was looking at Rudy Hubbard coming from Ohio State, and that made me think about 1938, right, with Bill Bell and Jake Gaithers. And am I correct in nodding in the direction of Ohio State for – at, at the very least, educating these men, uh, Bill Bell getting an opportunity to play at Ohio State. I mean, I think I learned from you that Ohio State had its first black letter winner in 1891, Michigan in 1890. Or am I am I am I giving them a little too much credit? No, I think well, some of it's just it's just it's circumstance, right? Like these guys, um, you know, a handful of African Americans, uh, you know, before World War One, and you're talking about like two dozen black people uh, playing and playing college football at northern institutions, um, lettering. Uh, Paul Robeson probably being and Fritz Pollard being the most successful of that era. Mm -hmm. uh, after World War One, you see it expand a little bit. Uh, and so you see it operating in new places, also in the north and then the Midwest and on the West Coast as well. Uh, so places like Iowa, uh, Michigan, Minnesota. Uh, and so these things begin to, to play Ohio State. Uh, and then what really kind of happens is that those men 
um, the the first generation, right? The men uh, who play at Case Western, like George Sampson, who I talk a little bit about in my book, who mm-hmm. founded, helped found football at Florida A and M. Matt Bullock, who played at Dartmouth, uh, who goes on to be a Morehouse coach uh, in uh, I want to say 1908, and coached at UMass and some other places. Those those racial pioneers at the turn of the century are really often founders, or if not founders, really kind of people who are institutional and stabilizing, creating what we think of as college football at HBCUs, right? Uh, and so they, because, you know, football is not an obvious game. Like when, I, when we talk about, uh, you know, I teach sports history and when we teach students, you know, baseball is a, you know, a game that's being played kind of all over the nation as a result of the, of the Civil War. People are very familiar with boxing, which is extremely popular. Um, but football is not really popular, right? Because in part, what's happening is that in the 19th century, You know, you have in these elite white spaces, you have rugby still being played. You have some form of soccer and then you have the creation of football at black colleges like football has these intricate set of rules. And so I'm not going to bore you guys with the history of college football, but Walter Camp is constantly like revising the game. And he's like trying to make it differentiated from uh, rugby and soccer, which are kind of contemporaries on college campuses and elite in the Northeast. And as the game becomes popular, you know, College black college students, men in particular, are looking for these extracurricular activities. They see all this discussion about thousands of fans watching football and they want to play. And one of the things that's kind of happening is this, is that that when you graduated from Case Western or you graduated from Brown or Dartmouth, you know, one of the few things, one of the few jobs you could get as a college educated person, especially from the kind of elite PWI, was that you could become a teacher at uh, at and around what we think of as historically black colleges. And so I talk a little bit about this in the book, and I think this should be noted. Now, what we think of as black colleges are really kind of like black prep schools that include high schools, they include kind of post-secondary, what they call normal schools, which are kind of teachers' colleges, they no, have man. seminaries, medical schools. So all those kinds of things are there, and these educated black men and women are returning to this education and are getting a foothold in these institutions across the South. And one of the things that they bring with them, along with, you know, their understanding of how to, do, you know, run a debate team and teach their classes and all this knowledge is also extracurricular activities, including college football. Talking with Dr. White, uh, author of Blood, Sweat and Tears, Jake Gaither, Florida A&M and the History of Black College Football. One of the things you, you touched on there was a small thing, I think, to many, but a big thing to me because I, I remember telling my my best friend, uh, his, his parents have been in uh, higher education for his entire life. His father was a football coach and had actually worked with, Graham, with Eddie Robinson at Gramlin. And I said, what is this normal school BS? And he said, yeah, I don't like it either because it was the Louisiana State Normal School for Negroes, I think is uh, uh-huh. okay. And then you had you had the president Ralph Waldo, I want to say Emerson Jones, say, mm-hmm. "Hey, look, we want to change that to Gramlin. Why? Because our cheerleaders can't get that out before we score again." And I'm going, "All right, that's funny, but it shouldn't be that." And the same thing with with FAMU. And I'm going, "I don't like this. I'm glad that they changed it, but normal school was meant to be teachers college." And I'm going, "Why don't we just say teachers college?" And it was, I get it's a small thing, but it, it bothered me. And I guess that speaks to where we are today as opposed to what was accepted. Well, I think, I mean, I think teachers college is that in, in many ways, you got to remember it across the South, right? That most in, in many rural communities, you know, black education didn't probably extend past the sixth grade, right? Mm-hmm. And so a normal education meant that you had a little bit of college training that kind of prepared you to go in these overcrowded classrooms in these rural communities across the South uh, and in these one room school rooms in many cases. And you were prepared to teach, right? You were able to teach, you know, kids from age of five all the way to adults in night school and the, basically the reading and writing and arithmetic, right? <laughs> um, and normal school prepared you for those tasks, right? Um, but, you know, black colleges were and so Grambling has that unique history. Florida A&M has some of that history. 
Um, they also are an A and M, right? So they have a vocational wing, an agricultural mechanical, right? And so you have A and T, which is North Carolina A and T. You have those Prairie View A and M, uh, and these schools in particular have our agricultural vocational base, and so you learn a set of skills, right? And so it's not unusual at Tuskegee to learn wheel writing, right? Or home economics if you were a woman, right? And so those things too were being translated into schools. You had um, you had liberal arts, what we think of as a traditional college and a small number of HBCUs like Fisk, which were liberal arts colleges who taught traditional kind of classical education. You know, they taught algebra, they taught religion, they taught sociology and history. Um, these All those schools did some of that but they had degrees in it. You taught, had to teach, you know, take um, Latin at Fisk. Um, and then you also had medical schools, what we think of as, as early professional schools. Um, so Howard was a liberal arts school with a set of professional schools behind it, both in nursing and, and medicine, Meharry Medical College. And so each one of the, you know, across the South and then, and of course, in the North, where you have Wilberforce and, and Cheney State and, and Pennsylvania and Wilberforce in Ohio, you have Langston in Oklahoma, um, that these colleges, you know, try to fit the needs, the broad needs of African-Americans who were in many ways trying to live out uh, their, what, what scholars call their freedom dreams and their freedom rights, right, um, that were being curtailed by Jim Crow and uh, on, on the backside of slavery, right? And so I think that there's, you know, we get, you know, I think the, 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 the nomenclature of how we describe those schools can feel um, uh, abrupt and jagged to our kind of, uh, to our contemporary ears. But I think it's also, like I always tell students, is we have to think about the moment in which they're, they're created. Mm -hmm. And I think it also speaks to the, the aspirations of these institutions that they, they themselves called themselves colleges, right? That they wanted to be known as colleges, even though many of them barely had college curriculum, and most of them didn't even have that many college students. Uh, they had more high school students, normal students, uh, vocational students, and they had what they thought of as college students. One of the things you uh, helped me understand was what the Orange Bowl, or uh, excuse me, Orange Blossom Classic. See, I did it again. Orange Blossom Classic was and what it represented because I grew up with the Bayou Classic, right? And I think mm -hmm. that like my parents know about the Orange Blossom Classic because my my parents are boomers, uh, and but I was I was taught a bit about it while we still lived in Florida. Moved to to Tulsa when I was thirteen and been here ever since, more or less. I had no idea that this game had been going on pre-World War II and that it became the de facto national championship game. I was always told that it just was. And yet this was also such a big deal for so many people, not just in, in its in, in it fam you, but for the SWAC, for what would become the MEAC. For, I mean, because if you were picked to play in this game against fam you, that was representative of a good season. You want to every opportunity to beat them, and they were just kind of expected to be there. As I said, like, I grew up with the Bayou Classic, and Grambling is the pinnacle of black college football success. And it's like, hey, actually, no. And that's kind of the, I think, the backbone of your book here is I make this, this reference all the time. It's everybody knows Eddie Robinson. Everybody knows Grambling. But if I bring Jake Gaither's name up, it doesn't resonate, even as he was a much more successful football coach. Right. They, as contemporaries, I mean, Gaither, like Gaither is the elite coach in his 25 years. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, uh, you know, like I think one of the things that when I started this project, I was based I was at Florida Atlantic as a professor. That was my first job. And and I knew of my brother had been a, has, is a FAMU alum. And so I knew a lot about FAMU and I knew about Gaither um, kind of colloquially and kind of informally. But if you ask me about black college sports, I would, you know, like everyone else, I would go to Eddie Robinson as kind of the go to explanation. Right. Um, and as I was investigating, you know, in my, in, in early in the research process, it was really clear that Florida A&M by 1955, mm -hmm. you know, his first 10 years, he had basically turned it into the elite program. Like, did they win every year? But no, they were like Alabama. Like you measured right. your success against Florida A&M, right? Um, and that was the way, that was the bar upon which all the other programs had to meet. Even if they had Hall of Fame coaches, 
like um, Ace Mumford at Southern was a legendary. Billy Nix at Prairie View was legendary. B- Eddie Robinson is climbing up those ranks having to deal with, you know, I always make the note that Eddie Robinson's popularity is, is much due to NFL pro football. That's mm-hmm. one part. And the other part is that he coached on the other side of integration. Mm-hmm. And so he's really the last great coach of that previous era to continue into like most of them don't make it. John Merritt makes it a little bit. He's a lot younger than those other guys. Um, And so he's the last of that, you know, that, that old generation of Billy Nix and Ace Mumford and Gaither um, and, and, you know, a whole host of others who uh, were essential in really establishing the kind of greatness of, of black college football after slightly before World War II, but definitely on the other side of World War II. Uh, and so Eddie Robinson is great, but like Gaither, I was shot. I mean, you know, like FAMU fans will tell you that he's the winningest coach, which is their way of saying that when you measure the winning percentage mm-hmm. of, of Gaither, um, it's like 86% or something of his wins, right? I mean, like in the co- modern parlance, we're talking about like, um, I describe it as like Urban Meyer is like the only coach. Maybe Nick Saban is now crossed over that threshold. But we're talking about two or three coaches in the entire history of college football that have won 88, 87 percent of their games um, for more than 20 years. Right. Mm-hmm. Like people have done it. You know, like it's one thing to do it for seven or eight years, but for to coach for 25 consecutive years uh, and have your worst season is losing four games. Um, that's that's just crazy. Um, and so that's that's where that's where Gaither was. And. And and Eddie Robinson would admit this, right, that, you know, the the path through the title most years required you to have to go to the Orange Blossom Classic Mm. and win. You can hear the full conversation between myself and Dr. Derek E. White at the RJ Young Podcast. There's a link in the description below. Please rate it, review it, download it as often as you possibly can, send it to a friend or an enemy. It's also ad-free for this episode. So be sure to take advantage of that. It's an hour. It's well worth your time. Thanks for being here. Deuces.